Hello everyone, welcome to the Stats Workshop. Right now we are going to be going over bootstrapping and permutation testing. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So that name probably caught the attention of some of you. Bootstrapping. What does that mean? Well, it comes from the phrase pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps which refers to the literal act of grabbing the straps on your boots and pulling up so that you lift yourself off of the ground. So basically, it's a phrase that refers to the completely absurd. I believe that the reason it is called this has something to do with the fact that the statistical technique itself sounds crazy at first. It really kind of sounds like you're making something out of nothing. However, the purpose of this slide is to make it clear that despite its namesake, bootstrapping works very well. Many empirical tests have shown that it is effective and accurate, and I need you to keep that in mind as we keep going through these slides. So what is bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is a process where you estimate the sampling distribution of a statistic by resampling from your data with replacement. So first you randomly sample a population and you get your data. Then you randomly choose points from that data, this is the resampling, and allow yourself to take the same points multiple times. This is the replacement part of it. So then you repeat that step, you repeat that resampling process many, many times and you get thousands of resamples. You then calculate a sample statistic from each resample, for example, the mean, and then build a distribution of your sample statistics. This distribution is called the bootstrap distribution and it is used as an estimate for the sampling distribution. Now let's all take a deep breath and think about this. We are using the sample we took to estimate something that represents all possible samples we could ever take. Now that is kind of crazy and some of you are probably confused as to how and why this works. So in order to explain why this works and why bootstrapping can be used to estimate the sampling distribution, I'm going to read out this quote from a fantastic textbook chapter that describes it better than I ever could. So the original sample represents the population from which it was drawn. So resamples from this sample represent what we would get if we took many samples from the population. The bootstrap distribution of a statistic, based on many resamples, represents the sampling distribution of the statistic based on many samples. So, we are assuming that the sample is a good representation of the original population, which is why we can resample from it to emulate the act of taking many samples from the population. Alright, I imagine that some of you are still probably confused after all that, so let's jump over to R and go over it again more slowly while creating some examples. So please open up the bootstrap work subfolder from the stats workshop folder and open up the bootstrap script working RMD file. I'll see you all in our studio. All right, so we are now in the bootstrapped script working.rmd file. And the first thing we're going to do is load up the boot package. So if you have not already installed boot, please run install.packagesboot down in the console, and then run library boot to load the package up into our R session. And the next thing we're going to do is load up an example data distribution. So dat.rda is a data set that should already be inside of your bootstrapped work folder. And this is just something non-Gaussian that I made up. It's meant to mimic a non-normal data set with 1,550 data points. And let's take a look at it using hist. So 
we can see down here that this is a very non-normal distribution. We have one big peak here and then a smaller peak over here. And this is the data set that we're going to use bootstrapping to analyze. Now R has some built-in functions for doing resampling and bootstrapping, such as the boot function that we just loaded up a second ago. But for learning purposes, we are going to start by doing things more or less by hand with a computer. So first thing we, the first thing we have to do is learn how to make a resample. Now, just to remind everyone, we are going to draw samples with replacement, so they don't have to be unique, from the data. Now, in order to do this, we're going to take advantage of the fact that every value in our data table has an index number that can be used to pull that value out of the data frame. So by creating a random set of index values with replacement, we can pull a random set of data points out of the data set with replacement. So we need a bunch of integers between 1 and 1550, and the simplest way to get them is to use the R sample.int command with replacement specified. So just as an example, we are going to get 10 values between 1 and 10. And if we look down here, you can see that we have a set of numbers now, and some numbers seem to come up multiple times, like 7 and 2, while other numbers don't come up at all, such as 8. This is the replacement part of our resampling. All right, now let's do it for real. So we're going to do the same thing again, only this time we're going to take 1,550 values from between 1 and 1,550 with replacement specified. A more elegant way to type this is to just specify the length of your data frame. And then once we have stored these indices within a variable called int, we can just use this int variable to index dat, and we can then assign the replacement to a new variable, which we are going to call dat rs for dat resample. Let's have a quick look at dat rs using a histogram. So running this block. And you can see that we get something that looks pretty much just like the original histogram that we made of DATRS. And this should be the case unless you get a very strange resample. So now to make things easier, I'm just going to write you a function to do the resampling for you many times over. All you need to do to create this function is run this code block. But since this is the first time some of you might ever encounter making your own function, we're going to read through it step by step. So first we create a name, make resamples, that we make equal to our function. Then we're going to specify two arguments for our function. Dat, which is going to be the data frame we are resampling from, and n resamps, which is going to be the number of resamples we want to take from our data frame. Now everything inside these little squiggly brackets here is going to be what actually is our function. So the first thing the function is going to do is that it will specify a output matrix. This is a two-dimensional matrix that will store all of our resamples. If any of you are wondering what is a two-dimensional matrix, it's a table. It's basically just a table for our purposes today. So you don't really have to worry about it too much. Then the next thing the function will do is do a for loop that is basically going to do that thing we just did where we create indices and use them to resample from our data frame. It's going to do that many, many times. And each time it does, it's going to store that resample inside of our two-dimensional matrix, which it will then return at the end of the function. So now all we have to do is run this block. And now we have created a function built into our session that will work exactly 
like the functions that are already in R and the functions you can find in packages. You can run it just like you would a normal function, such as the mean. Just as an example, you can run make resamples dat equals dat and resamps equals five, and that would take five resamples from our dat data frame. Now I'd like you to actually test out this function. So you're going to take 10 resamples from our dat data frame, and then I would like you to look at a couple of them using hist. All of these resamples you're taking should look pretty similar. Then after you have completed that, we are going to generate a lot of resamples, and then we are going to look at the distribution of means in our resamples. So we are going to get 10, uh, two, 2,000 resamples, then we are going to use the apply function to calculate the mean of each one of those resamples. And then after that, we are going to plot the distribution of our resample means using the hist function. And this distribution that you're going to make is the bootstrap distribution, which will represent a estimation of the sampling distribution for the mean of our data set. The last little thing you're going to do then is you're going to take the mean of the original sample using the mean function and then compare that to the mean of our distribution of resamples. And I want you to kind of ask yourself, how similar do these two means look? All right. Finally, the last thing we're going to do in this little section of R is we're going to do that all over again, this time using R's most popular bootstrapping package, which is creatively named Boot. So I want you to check the Boot package documentation using help boot. There is a lot of information on this file, but for now we're going to focus on the first three arguments. So data, which is going to be the data frame we're using. Statistic, which is going to be a function that will calculate whatever statistic we're interested in. So today we're doing the mean. So we have created a function here that is going to calculate the mean for you. That is going to be our input to the statistic argument. And finally, we have R, which is going to be the number of resamples we want to take. So you're going to run the boot function and store it in something called output. And then we are going to extract the actual uh, bootstrap distribution from the boot output that we are going to make. Okay. Now, once we have actually gotten the bootstrap distribution, we can use it to estimate all kinds of very useful things. So now we're going to head back over to the slides to see what we can actually use the bootstrap distribution for. So, why would we even use bootstrapping? What are the benefits? Well, the first thing is that it is a great way to explore your data. When we talk about sampling distributions and t distributions, these are all theoretical things that we predict. With bootstrapping, you can actually create the bootstrap distribution and look at it. Once you start bootstrapping, it tends to become very intuitive. The second reason is that bootstrapping does not require the assumption of normality. Bootstrapping can be used to infer important information from extremely non-normal data. The third reason is that compared to something like the t-test, it is less sensitive to error caused by small sample sizes. Note that I said less sensitive. There is no statistical test that does not do significantly better with a larger sample. There is no substitute for good, large data sets. The fourth reason is that it can be generalized to explore statistics other than the mean. The t-test only works if you are looking at means, while bootstrapping can be used for other things, like the trimmed mean, which is sort of like the median. The fifth reason is that it can be used to estimate the standard error and to get very accurate confidence intervals. I will show you how to do that in just a moment. The final reason is that bootstrapping can be used to perform a permutation test. Now a permutation test is a kind of hypothesis test 
that is often more accurate than traditional methods, such as the t-test. We will also go over how to do this. So how do you estimate the standard error of a variable using bootstrapping? Well, the standard error is literally defined as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. The bootstrap distribution, which we just made, is an estimate of the sampling distribution. So you take the standard deviation of the bootstrap distribution and you're done. You have an estimate of the standard error now. It's the easiest thing in the world and we are going to move on. Now when it comes to confidence intervals, things get a little more tricky. So there are several different ways to calculate them. Do not worry too much about the calculations yet. We will go over all of them in R. Now, if the bootstrap distribution is normal and it is not skewed, so it has this kind of nice symmetrical sh bell shape like this, then we can use the traditional T confidence interval, which is equal to the, the statistic plus or minus T star times the standard error. T star is the critical value of T with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And it is very easy to calculate an R, so don't worry too much about it. Another way that we can calculate the confidence interval is by calculating the 2.5th and 97.5th percentiles of the bootstrap distribution. This is literally just the act of saying that 95% of the results fall somewhere between, let's say, this point and this point. So now these two points are the 95% confidence interval. Now one of the great things about these two methods is that if you are ever unsure if your distribution is normal and symmetric, you can just use both methods and see if the confidence intervals they make agree with each other. If both methods find similar confidence intervals, then it is safe to use either method. Now what do we do if the bootstrap distribution is not normal and skewed? like this graph over here, where it's clearly skewed over to the left. Well, luckily, there are several methods that can adjust for skewness and non-normality. Some examples are the Bootstrap Bias Corrected Accelerated Method, or BCA, and the Bootstrap Tilting Method. Both of these methods are somewhere between difficult and impossible to perform by hand, so they are always done on a computer. These are my favorite methods. These methods work great regardless of whether your bootstrap distribution is normal or skewed or not. And the only real problem is that they are much more computationally expensive than the methods that assume normality and symmetry. We're going to jump back over into R now so we can look at these different confidence intervals as well as standard error with some examples. All right, so now we are going to actually use our bootstrap distribution to estimate the standard error and 95% confidence intervals of the sampling distribution. So we're gonna start off with standard error. This is incredibly easy. Just take the standard deviation of the distribution function using R's SD function, and you should be all set. Moving on to the confidence intervals where things get a little more complicated. The first thing we're going to look at is the scenario where the sampling distribution looks normal and symmetrical. With this, you can use the traditional T confidence interval. So in order to do that, we are going to set our alpha value as equal to 0 0.05. Then we are going to use our QT function to calculate the critical T value. And then we are going to use the equation we saw in the slides to calculate the lower and upper bounds of the 95% confidence interval. Moving on from that, we are also going to look at the percentile method. And for this, we are going to use the boot.ci function of the boot package. So please run help boot.ci and we're going to get the help file we see here, and then we're going to focus on the first three arguments. Boot.out is an object of class boot. So this is just going to be the output of the original time when we run, ran the boot function. So you should be able to find this 
up earlier, we named it output. Then there is the conf argument, which is just going to be the um, confidence interval we're looking at for. So we're going to do 0 0.95. And then there is the type. This is the most important argument. This is where you specify what kind of bootstrap confidence interval you want. So for this first time we, we are running it, we're going to run perk. Now with this information, you should have everything you need to find the percentile bootstrap confidence interval. Once you have created it, we're going to use our code here to see if this confidence interval makes sense by actually checking how much of the data from our original bootstrap distribution falls within our confidence interval. Finally, we're going to look at the situation where what if our bootstrap distribution wasn't normal? So we're going to use the bias corrected accelerated confidence interval. Again, we're just going to run boot.ci, only this time we're going to change the type to bca. So do that, save it in a variable called bcaci, and then we are done calculating confidence intervals. For now, we're going to head back to the slides so we can learn how we're going to perform a permutation test. Now let's get into the way in which we can test hypotheses with bootstrapping. This is done through the permutation test. It is a lot like a two-sample t-test in that you are comparing samples taken from two different populations slash groups with your null being that there is no difference between the groups and your alternative being that there is indeed some kind of difference. When doing a permutation test, we use resampling to build what is called a permutation distribution for our statistic. This distribution represents the sampling distribution if the null is true and there really is no difference between our groups. Then we just need to see where our sample statistic falls on our permutation distribution in order to calculate a p-value. Now, everything I just said is all fine and good, but what does it actually mean to resample from both of our samples in a manner that is consistent with the null hypothesis? I think this is best explained with a diagram. So in order to resample in a way that is consistent with the null hypothesis, we take our original two samples and then we scramble them together into one big sample. Then we resample from that combined sample without replacement. And we basically just sort them into two new random groups. Then we calculate a statistic, such as the mean, and then we repeat that many, many times and create a permutation distribution. The reason we do this is because if the null hypothesis is true, then there is no difference between the original two samples. They both came from identical populations. Any differences we see were just caused by random assignment. So we use permutation testing to emulate many repetitions of this random assignment. Then our permutation distribution shows how likely it is that random assignment creates a certain amount of variation between the groups. Similarly to how bootstrapping creates something representative of the sampling distribution if our sample is accurate, permutation resampling creates the sampling distribution that would exist if our null hypothesis were true. All right, now here are the steps to completing the permutation test, but I'm actually going to skip over these and go straight into an example in R where we will go through each of these steps point by point while actually performing the test. So I'm just leaving these here as a quick reference for anyone who wants a quick verbal description of the process. And with that, let's jump into R and figure out the permutation test step by step. Okay, so before we get into permutation testing, I actually am going to remake my resampling function with a few key alterations. And I'm going to call this make resamples2. So here I am defining my make resamples2 function, and there are two key differences with this function I want you to notice. The first is a new argument, nsamps. 
And what this does is that it allows us to specify the number of data points we want within each of our resamples. Now the second difference is that we have set replace equals to false. And that is because when we are doing permutation resampling, we want to resample without replacement. All right, so we will just run this to define the function. And now we are ready to move on to actually doing the permutation test. So the first thing we need to do is just make a couple of normal samples. We are going to do this using our norm, exactly like what we did with the two-sample t-test and the paired t-test. We're going to call them x1 and x2. For x1, please give it a mean of 2, a standard deviation of 2, and 27 data points. And for x2, we are going to give it a mean of 1, a standard deviation of 3, and 47 data points. So after you create those two samples, you can look at them using hist, and we can move on. Now, let's say our alternative hypothesis is going to be that the mean of x1 is greater than the mean of x2. Well, then the first thing we need to do is take the difference of the two means. And we're going to do x1 minus x2, which means that our alternative hypothesis is that the differences will be positive. So just store that difference in x differences observed. And then the next thing we're going to do is, just like we did in the slides, we're going to put both of our samples together. We are going to scramble them together into one big sample. And we are going to do that by concatenating our x1 and x2 vectors using the C function. So create your one big sample. We're going to call it x. And now we are going to take 5,000 resamples from our combined samples. And this is where the ability to specify the number of data points in each resample becomes important. Because for all of our resamples, we want the sample size of the resamples to be the same as the sample size of the original sample. So for x1, we want all of the resamples to have a size of 27. And for x2, we want all of the resamples to have a size of 47. Now, once we have created those, we need to find the means of all of our resamples. So we're going to do that using the apply function again. Then we need to calculate the difference between all of our resample means. And after that, we're going to put all of those differences together into a big histogram. And this histogram is going to be a permutation distribution. And it should look something like this. Now, remember, the permutation distribution is an estimate of the sampling distribution. And if you remember what we talked about, when we first described the sampling distribution and we discussed how that relates to hypothesis testing, you will realize that all we need to do now is take our original difference, into the difference from our two original samples, and see where it falls on this histogram and then calculate a p-value. So in order to calculate that p-value, we can use this bit of code here, what this does is that it simply shows us the proportion of our resamples where the resample difference in means is less than the original difference in means between our two original samples. This proportion we're going to get is exactly equal to the p-value. So we're looking for this proportion to be below 0.05 if our alpha level is 0.05. Once we have done this and calculated this value, we have completed the permutation test. Now, let's hop on back over to the slides and wrap things up. All right, so as the last thing we're going to do today, let's quickly go over the assumptions of the permutation test. First of all, Random sampling, of course. There are basically no traditional statistical techniques that do not make this assumption. The second assumption is that the two populations need to have identical distributions under the null hypothesis. Now, this is kind of a weird assumption because it is an assumption that relates to the null rather than relating to the data itself.
So suffice to say, it is usually reasonable to assume that the populations have identical distributions under the null hypothesis, since we are the ones defining the null in the first place. So don't worry too much about it. And finally, I just want to reiterate that there is no assumption about normality when performing the permutation test, which is extremely useful. All right, that's it. Just as a last thing, I'd like to recommend one additional resource, which is a special chapter 18 from the Practice of Business Statistics. It is a fantastic place to get some more information on bootstrapping and permutation testing. Since it is about business, the examples are not super relatable for biology, but they are really easy to understand and are well illustrated. So I highly recommend you try this out. And that will be everything for today. Thank you.